Would you stand for the reading of our Holy Scripture? Today we're reading from 2 Corinthians 5, verses 16 through 21. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. <clears throat> Would you pray with me? Oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts and the words we speak in public be acceptable in your sight, we pray, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Outrage is everywhere these days. It doesn't seem like you can go far without somebody getting upset, going ballistic, uh, going overboard, jumping down someone's throat. It can be on social media. It can be uh, in the grocery store aisle. It can be anywhere and everywhere. You make a, a statement on Facebook, or, or not a statement, let's say you, even something as simple as putting a picture of you holding up your favorite soft drink. Oh, I love Coca-Cola, or I love Pepsi, or I love Mountain Dew, and somebody's going to comment and say, well, did you not know that that company practices bad labor practices, and they're evil in some way, and you're like, I'm just showing a picture of Coke. You go to a family gathering for Thanksgiving, or Christmas, or Mother's Day, please don't do it today. But you go to a family gathering and somebody makes a, a brief, maybe you, make a brief, offhanded, innocent comment about something that might be on the edge of politics or controversy. And all of a sudden you have to listen to a 30-minute diatribe by Uncle Larry who cannot sit still without making everything he says known to you and everybody else in the room. Outrage is everywhere. We cringe when elections come up now, don't we? Every time the election comes around, whether it's for school board or, or, or Congress or, or for Senate or for presidents, whoever it is, suddenly we just feel this anxiety rising within us because, oh no, here it comes again. Societal interactions have become nothing more than, than schoolyard yelling matches. You're a liar. No, you're a liar. I can't believe you did this. I can't believe you said that. And the names start coming out. And you're in this, and you're that, and you're this, and you're that. As a result, we walk around either too scared to say anything to anybody about anything, or we find ourselves being sucked into the outrage, joining in the fray, if you will. We are living in a world of outrage. At least part of the world seems to get caught up in it. Maybe we're not caught up in it. Others are caught up in it. It's around us. We see anger and division and hostility. Outrage is all around. And so we have to decide, how are we going to walk through this world as the people God has called us to be? We are living in a day when we need to live like Christ in the public sector now more than ever. We are walking around in a day and age when our words matter even more. And not just the words we say, but how we say them, and the attitudes behind them, and the motivators of them. All of this matters, living in this world of outrage. In the midst of screaming and shouting and angry words and, and, and angry posts on Facebook, the world needs a light to shine in the darkness, the light of Christ. 
the light of Christ's love, of his grace, of his mercy, of his compassion, all while proclaiming his truth. Now, to be sure, there's a lot in the world that is outrage-inducing. There's a lot of things in the world that, that stir us and make our blood, blood boil, if you will. Uh, there's terrorism, sex trafficking, racism, child poverty, opioid addiction. There's violence in schools. All of these are issues that are, deserve a passionate yet constructive and helpful response. But sometimes, Sometimes our anger becomes too much. Our righteous indignation morphs into something that it's not meant to be. Righteous indignation can become, if we let it, unbridled outrage. These questions that we wrestle with as we talk about the outrage of this world in which we live and how to live as a Christian are not easy answers, not easy questions to, to answer. But they do deserve our consideration. If we want to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ in our communities, and in our world, and in our neighborhoods, and on social media. This morning, as we are beginning a new sermon series, uh, which is a little different than a normal sermon series around here, uh, this is what I call a uh, This Will Preach sermon series. You've, we've done these before from time to time. I probably do three or four a year. Uh, but basically what these sermon series are, they, they come out of something I'm reading, Christian literature, a Christian author, and I come across and I read it and I'm like, man, this will preach. And that's when I kind of go, oh yeah, maybe that's God telling me I need to preach it. I need to share that with you. And so this is one of those This Will Preach sermons. I've got another series I'm going to teach uh, and preach in the, in the summer. It's about relationships. We'll deal with that one then. But this one all comes from a particular book by the title of the same title of this sermon, which is Christians in an Age of Outrage. It's written by a fellow named Ed Stetzer. Ed Stetzer is the Billy Graham Distinguished Chair of Church Mission and Evangelism and also a dean at the school uh, of Wheaton College. He is also the former research guru of Lifeway. You maybe have heard him or his research quoted before if you read Christian literature. Uh, he is quoted quite often uh, on the radio and Christian radio and things like that. Uh, he, is, he is someone who's been around uh, for a while. His book, of which I'm only going to cover just a brief portion of it, uh, is uh, timely and important because it is the fact of the matter that we are living in this age of outrage. And how are we going to live in that age of outrage? How are we going to, to be the persons God has called us to be? We are living in a divided and divisive time. We are living in a world where people are angry about everything. They're angry about politics and religion. They're angry about a lot of things. And some may say, hey, I'm just being passionate. I'm just a passionate person. I just can't help it. I'm passionate. But uh, passion is great. But unbridled passion can be hurtful and harmful, and detrimental. We are, we are in an age in which, which uh, uh, people are talking over one another. They're talking around one another. They're not talking uh, with one another. They're talking to one another. They're making sure their points get across. They can't have a conversation with somebody because they're too busy thinking about what point they want to make next, how they're going to slam their fist on their invisible pulpits, if you will. We live in this world in which we have forgotten what civil discourse is, is. We've forgotten what it's like to have an actual conversation where we are respectful and tolerant of the other person, even if we disagree with them. We've gotten to this world in which, which, which people say things they would have never said before, but they do say them now. Respect and tolerance has been redefined or thrown out the window. We live in a us-or-them world. We've lost the ability to, to agree to disagree. Instead, we have hate-filled speech. We minimize or, or dismiss people by demonizing them or by calling them names or by belittling them in some way, shape, or fashion. This is the world we're living in today. It is the age of outrage. And so how do we? How do we as believers in Jesus Christ, as, as, as Christians, you know what the word Christian means? Little Christ. That's literally what it means. Little Christ. How do we act as little Christ in the world of outrage? How do we bear witness to God's love and grace and peace and truth when people are seeking to burn the world down 
over matters of civics or government or morals or whatever it may be. Well, this is what we're going to look at today and over the next couple of weeks. How do we live as Christians in the age of outrage? So today we begin with a question. And the question we're going to look at today is this. Why? Why the age of outrage? How do we, how do we get to where we are? What's changed? What's, what's been going on in our society and world that has brought us to this place where we are so divided and so divisive in our world? Listen to the following quote. 82% of evangelical Christians polled believe that since the 2016 presidential election, groups within the Christian church have become increasingly polarized on the issues of politics. Now, would you agree with that? I think many of us would. If, if I had been a part of that poll, I certainly would agree too. But politics is just one area in which we seem to be divided on these days. We've become polarized over many issues, be it immigration or sexuality or sexual practice or abortion or, or climate change. Uh, sometimes we're just divided over, over what recipe to use for what meal at, with dinner. We just seem to be fighting over everything. But what's led to this increased polarization? Well, one of the, the major things that Ed Stetzer points out is that we, at this time in our world, are experiencing what he calls a cultural forking, okay? A culture, I'm going to explain what that means, but we're experiencing a cultural forking. Think about culture and society and our, our culture within the society uh, as a river. And that river flows in the direction of our collective beliefs and values. And within this river, there are four primary streams. Now, I've got a, a, a slide up there. This is from the book, and I wanted you to see this because it describes what's going on in our world today. Now, as you look at it, there's, there's, the river is, is board, boarded by the, the, uh, the b thick black lines. It moves from left to right, going down the stream of life, if you will, the river of life. And within it, there are four major streams. Uh, it, it's also divided by past, present, and future to kind of talk about where we've been, where we are, and what seems to be where we're headed. So let's talk first about the, three, the four different streams that are in there. If you look at the past there, at the top you see it says the word non-Christian. There was a day and a time when, when, when a, thir a fourth of our world, our society, our culture was non-Christian. Uh, other religions, just a secular worldview, secular mindset. The next three below that, cultural Christians, congregational Christians, and convictional Christians, these are groups of people who are all claim Christianity at one level or another, but they're distinct and different. The cultural Christians are those people who are Christian in title only, just something that was part of their heritage. Their grandma, their grandpa were Christians, uh, and so they were influenced by a, a, a Christian mindset or Christian worldview, but it's not necessarily they, something they've adopted fully for themselves, Although, if you asked them, you, they would say, well, that, you know, well, Grandpa, I believe what Grandpa believed. But, but really, they're not going to church. They're not really living. They may say they're a Christian, but they act like something completely different all the rest of the days of their lives. That's cultural Christians. The, the third one down is congregational Christians. Congregational Christians are what we call CEO Christians, okay? CEO Christians are Christmas and Easter only Christians. Uh, they, they come for the high and holy days. They might come for a funeral to a church. They might come for a wedding. But they're not, uh, they're it basically, it, it's kind of similar to the, uh, the cultural Christians, but, but they have a little more practice, if you will. And they, they have a little more adoption of the beliefs of the Christian faith. And, and they'll, they'll even fight for them. They'll argue for them sometimes. But it's not full, all-in adoption of Christian beliefs. The bottom for stream, if you will, is convictional Christians. Now, these are believers who uh, have identified themselves as Christians. They are regular attendees in church. They are people who take their faith very, very seriously, and they're seeking to live out their Christian faith on a, on a daily basis. So what you see in the past, what we've had is, uh, you see that black area there? That says cultural divide. And at one time in the past, we had this cultural divide between folks who were, were secular, that was about a fourth of our nation, to about three-fourths of our nation, which was which we, what we call the mainstream culture. And that mainstream culture was influenced by Judeo-Christian consensus. Even though it, we had different, different uh, levels of, of, of connect or, uh, commitment to that, there was an overall mainstream culture of Judeo-Christian consensus. But as you can see, in our present, things have changed. 
The cultural divide between the secular and the sacred or between non-Christians and Christians at different levels has suddenly gone away. And what we're seeing is more of an influence by the non-Christian and secular world influencing the mainstream of our culture. Now, you can see down below there that there's another cultural divide on the right-hand side. The cultural divide that's happening between convictional Christians and the one that's happening between the rest of everyone, the non-Christians, the cultural Christians, and the congregational Christians, who now are making up, or will make up, the mainstream culture, which is overarched by a secular mindset, a secular worldview, and a secular way of doing things. While there has been divergence and reunions in our cultural river over the years, overall, you can see that the overall consensus of the cultural river at one time was shaped by a common Judeo-Christian belief system. However, things have begun to change. We are no longer uh, living in, 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 in this world that we once used to live. Things have begun to change. The cultural consensus that once was has begun to evaporate. The majority of our cultural stream are no longer a, on the same Judeo-Christian page. There's four observations that Ed Stetzer makes about all this. He says in today's culture, things are changing. The first observation is that the non-Christian stream is the one that's expanding. The non-Christian stream is the one that's getting larger than it was. The second observation is that the convictional Christian stream has remained stable. So for those that are on that bottom stream, that uh, hold to Christian beliefs, hold them orthodox, hold to uh, church and discipleship and being a Christian in, the, in their world and their life, that stream remains about the same. However, it's the other two streams that are beginning to shift more. It says the cultural and congregational Christian streams have decreased and moved to a more secular worldview and values. And then finally, he says the worldview and values of convictional Christians as a result, have, has, have less influence over the overall cultural river in which we're living. In other words, three-fourths of the mainstream culture has begun to adopt a greater secular mindset. They're buying into the secular uh, uh, morals. They're buying into a secular worldview. They're buying into secular values. Uh, they're becoming less and less Christian. Christians are losing their cultural identity they once had. Many Christians today are becoming aware that the United States is no longer the Christian nation that it once was. The cultural division has bred anger. It's bred a sense of polarization amongst communities. And this has led people uh, to adopt thoughts and beliefs and practices which reflect more of the secular world than it does of the Christian world. In the midst of losing their cultural identity, many Christians are finding other identities to embrace. Uh, they, where they once had their main identity and who they were as a Christian, they're, they're uh, becoming more secularized, and so they're, they're, they're jumping on to new identities, new things they can grasp to, new things they can gravitate to. So they, they, they embrace things like a political identity. And so instead of being focused on God's kingdom and his mission to drive their engagement in the world, in other words, their faith uh, motivating them and driving them in engagement in the world to make a difference in the world for the kingdom of God, instead of that, what they're doing is they're adopting things like political agendas or social agendas or cultural agendas that do not necessarily reflect God, and they're jumping on those bandwagons. And they're allowing those things to be the things that motivate them to do what they do in life. People in this environment ch of change tend to join up with groups who center themselves with like-minded ideals. When we do that, we begin to get into this us and them mentality because we've got, oh, this is my new identity. This is who I am. This is what I'm about. You know, I'm, I'm all about this cause. And, and you kind of leave God to the side. And suddenly we begin, oh, it's us and it's them. And we think about that group. And everybody's got up a tribe. And everybody's got a group that they're assigned to, consciously or unconsciously. People are losing their Christian identity. And they're filling the void with whatever they can jump onto. And once they've done so, they begin to demonize those that don't agree with them because that identity becomes everything to them. All while excusing their own negative behavior because their new identity matters most. Groups can tend to, in this environment, to adopt a, a fear-based mentality. People become afraid of losing their rights, their voice, or their influence. This level of uncertainty breeds fear. It breeds distrust and anger. Each group vying for their seat at the table. 
All this breeds polarization where people are willing to create and affirm their rightness, all the while ignoring facts or logic or others' objections. One distinction of today's culture of outrage is how we often value confidence and aggression more than truth in our public interaction. Let me say that again. One thing that that marks this culture of outrage is how often we value confidence and aggression more than truth in our public interaction. So whoever has the loudest voice is the one that people think is right just simply because they're loud. Or they think that they can become right by being loud. If I'm just loud enough, if I, if I slam people enough on Facebook or if I scream enough about whatever the cause is that I want to embrace, then, then, then by golly, that makes me right, and it doesn't. The sad thing about it is uh, people can be right and be completely wrong at the same time. We as believers especially. We can be right theologically about something. We can be right morally about something. We can be right socially about something. We can be right logically about something, reasonably about something. We can be absolutely right and completely wrong in the same moment, depending on how we deliver that message. You hear that? We can be completely right about something and completely wrong at the same moment because of the way We deliver the message that we have. In his book, The Death of Expertise, Tom Nichols writes this. He says, Americans now believe that having equal rights in a political system means that each person's opinions about anything must be accepted as equal to anyone else. Just because you have an opinion, suddenly you feel that your opinion is always going to be right or that it's truth. Every, it's that absolute reality kind of thing, you know. It, it, or it, it's cultural relativity, really, where, where everybody's uh, beliefs or thoughts are supposed to be equal to everyone else's, that, 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 that your truth is as good as my truth rather than... That it, that's the secular world. If they're not accepted as equal, then outrage comes out. People get mad if you disagree with them because, by golly, I'm right just because I think it. It doesn't matter if, if everybody in the culture says something is right when it's wrong. If it's wrong, it's wrong. It doesn't matter if it's popular opinion or not. But if you disagree with me, by golly, I'm going to get angry. Because that's the culture of outrage in which we live. We've gone from a culture that could have civil disobedience, sorry, civil discourse to an all-out verbal war if someone disagrees with you. There's a, a timely quote along these lines. It's been accredited to many different people. I've actually used it earlier on. I accredited it to someone, and I've realized now after doing some research on it, there's like two or three different people this quote has been uh, given credit to. Uh, 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 let's see. Uh, Pastor Rick Warren has said to be the one who said this. Phil Robertson from Duck Dynasty has been said to be the one that said this. And also Dave Chappelle, the comedian, has been the one said to, to have said this. I don't care who said it. The quote is very good. And the quote is this. Our culture has accepted two huge lies. The first is that if you disagree with someone's lifestyle or or political opinion or or, 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 or social stance or whatever it may be, if you disagree with someone's lifestyle, you must fear them or hate them. The second is that to love someone means that you must agree with everything they believe or do. Both are nonsense. You don't have to compromise conviction to be compassionate. Sadly, many Christians have bought into this age of outrage. Many Christians are are getting online to get their point across. And they're taking their Bible and they're beating people up with it rather than allowing it to be truth of God's Word that heals and forgives and is compassionate and is merciful. It can still stand strong as the truth, but we don't have to beat people up with it. You can't beat somebody up with the Bible and get them into the heaven. That's not how they get into heaven. That's how many Christians have done. They've joined into the fray. They've joined that age of outrage. And in doing so, they have lost their witness for Jesus Christ. Instead of drawing people to Christ or pointing people to Christ or leading people to Christ, instead, what they have done, not necessarily by the the content of their words, but by their actions and their 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 attitudes behind it and the way they've spoken they have done everything to keep other people from Christ we all have a Christian witness 
Christianity is not a hat we wear on Sunday and Wednesday night. Our Christian faith is, is not something that should be just title only, or CEO only. Our faith should be something that we live and breathe and exude in everything we do and in everything we say and in how we do things and in how we say things. It should be our motivation. It should be our underlying attitude. It should be that thing which just pours out from us. Christ-likeness. And not a world of outrage. Yes, we live in a world that sadly chooses outrage as an acceptable mode of expressing one's view. A culture that doesn't mind tearing someone down in order to get their view or values across. A society which demonizes people who disagree with them. But that does not give us as Christians uh, the, 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 the free reign to join in. That is not who we are. Pardon me for pointing. Mom said never point to people. That is not who we are. That is not who we are. We are little Christs. We are to follow after the example of Jesus Christ and how he treated his enemies. We are to follow after the example of Jesus Christ and how he treated the marginalized. We are to follow after the example of Jesus Christ. Yes, proclaim the truth, but do it with grace. Proclaim the truth at all times. Don't back down. Don't, don't belittle or, 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 or minimize the truth, but don't minimize others when you proclaim the truth. Be who you're called to to be while you're upholding the truth. We are Christ's ambassadors. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. Say that with me. We are Christ's ambassadors. You know what an ambassador is? An ambassador represents someone or something. We have ambassadors to South America. We have ambassadors to Africa. We have ambassadors to all the different countries in the world and all those kind of things. And those people represent the United States and the United States' interest, and, and they, are, they are the United States in that place. As Christians, we are called to be ambassadors in this world. We're called to be ambassadors for Christ in the grocery store line. And, and we're supposed to be ambassadors for Christ on Facebook, on Twitter, on social media. We're supposed to be ambassadors for Christ in the ways that we respond to uh, comments at the bottom of some social board or, or discussion or some book where you, you post something. You are an ambassador of Christ no matter where you are. And do not think like the world does that says, you know, hey, I'm behind a screen so I can say whatever I want to say. No, that's not how it works. That's how the world does it. That's not how Christ calls us to be. We are called to be the ambassadors of Christ. And if Christ is a, is, a, is a God of love and grace and mercy and peace and truth, then we too are to be a persons of grace and peace and mercy and truth in the world. We are Christ's ambassadors. And we live in a world of outrage. How do we bring our best when the world is at its worst. That's what we're going to look at in the next couple of Sundays. I hope you will be here with me. I hope you will join us for this important series. And I hope it will make a difference in your life so that we all can make a difference in our world. Amen? Amen. Amen.